Hello, Doctor Who fans, wherever you are, and welcome to another Who Corner to Corner podcast. My name is Paul. As always, I'm with the fellow in the conservatory whose name is Jeff. Hi, Jeff. How you doing, my old chum? Can we not introduce me as the fellow in the conservatory? It sounds a That's bit dodgy. It's the first time I've introduced you in yeah. that way. I mean, it's where you are. You are the chap in the conservatory. Yes, sir. I know. <laughs> I don't know why you're in the conservatory. I mean, that's your business, to be honest, mate. But, you know. Well, the studio's still getting built. It's not finished yet. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> but, Jeff, we are not alone, are we? We are sir? not. No. We are not alone. We have yet another fabulous guest from the world of Doctor Who, and many more, in fact. Yes. Um, because as fans of TV sci-fi, you will no doubt be aware that back in the old days, the special effects and mod work of said TV sci-fi, and he's smiling Riley now, I can see this, um, was generally kind of, um, it was it was innovative. It was always been innovative. So I want to put that one right out there. But sometimes the budget meant that innovation stretched to how many times can we use this piece of string and washing up bottle? However, the imaginations of many children, myself included, were fired by these feats of innovative, creative brilliance frankly, and we all marveled at our TV screens and thought, wow, that looks amazing. And of course, nowadays, they're just as amazing. So yeah. we are delighted to welcome none other than visual effects wizard and model maker master extraordinaire, Mr. Mike Tucker. Hello, Mike. Good evening. Hello there both. Hello. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good, Fantastic. good. Thank you for joining us. Not at all. On, on this rainy evening, is it raining yes, where you are? I'm yeah. hoping you're not hearing it hammering down outside my windows. But... <laughs> it's pretty nasty. The, the whereabouts, been, whereabouts yeah. are you, Mike? I'm in the um, the depths of Oxfordshire. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm in nice. deepest, very darkest pleasant. West Sussex. And uh, it's it's been hammering down most of the day, actually. So. Yeah, it, it, it tends to do that, mate, this time of yeah, year. Yeah. You know, uh, well, yeah. you say that, but last week, you know, it was, it was topping up the town <gasps> weather. You oh know, my goodness! It really was, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, and, yeah. And now, because we were we, we we were by the sea. Yes, like, just a yeah, we of weeks were. Ago. Yeah, <laughs> it's getting slightly burnt. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. But there you go. So, Mike, yes, as Jeff said, welcome to the podcast. It's a delight and an honour to have you join us. So, so thank you for that. So, oh, thank um, you for inviting what, me. It's very nice oh, of you. You're very welcome. You're very welcome indeed. So what we're going to do is we have a few questions, both from our good selves and also a bunch of our listeners and followers on, on our socials as well. So we're going to fire these at you and see how we get on. So okay. I'm going to start with the first one because that kind of makes sense. Um, so here we go. The first question is, Mike, I would like to know, and our listeners would like to know, have you always had a passion for model making and visual effects? How did it all begin? Yeah, I mean, I I loved building models as a kid. I mean, I was definitely one of those kids who was into Lego and Meccano and Airfix mm. kits and all the rest of it. Um, and I sort of knew that I wanted to turn that, even from a young age, I wanted to turn that into a career. Mm. But at the time, I thought that career was going to be building dioramas for museums. I always used to <laughs> love going to... Cardiff Museum and the London Natural History Museum and there were these display cases little windows yeah. with forced perspective dioramas of prehistoric scenes mm. or historical scenes and I was absolutely obsessed with these and I, I thought well that's a really nice job if I can get it um, and then I discovered um that there was this magical department called the BBC Visual Effects Department. Uh -huh. And that was because Bernard Wilkie had appeared on a BBC magazine daytime program mm. called Pebble Mill at One. Yeah. And he was promoting Blake Seven at the time, I think, <gasps> more than Doctor Who. Yeah. Uh, and suddenly I realised that there was this thing where you couldn't just build the models, mm. you could film the models and blow up the models and do things with the models. And suddenly <laughs> that focus shifted because mm. I'd always loved things like Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet and Stingray and the Ray Harryhausen films yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, and indeed Doctor Who and Blake Seven. But it had never really occurred to me that there was a department of people who actually did this for a living. And once I discovered that that was a possibility, there was no other career for me, really. That's where I was going to head. Oh, wow. So you were really focused on it then? Like, Absolutely, like... from a very young age. Yeah, yeah I, th I think when you're young like that, you you don't, well, you know, how would you know? But you don't realise that 
you know, actually someone makes all this stuff. And, yeah. you know, kind of like, you know, I remember when, you know, I watched Terminator 2 and I was like 11 and it blew my mind. And I, you know, I thought, oh, you know, Arnie's amazing. But then who is this director? Mm. You know, and, oh, so, so someone's doing this. And, you know, and then that kind of led to my filmmaking interest. And, and also Cameron had a similar start to you he was buying you know models and things like that making home movies and blowing stuff up as well and yes yeah, so it's quite interesting yeah, that my dad had a like a clockwork super eight camera and he said well you know here you go go off do what you want to do and i was building models and daleks and i built a model canine i was doing stop motion animation with my action amazing man. um do you still have any of those old films yeah yeah they actually do. um they got used on um, one of the Blu-rays recently. Um, I have, I, it must be one of the Sylvester McCoy um, era Blu-rays. And um, Stuart Manning was doing the documentary. And uh, he asked if I had any of the Super 8 film. And they transferred it and, and put it out. So, Excellent. yeah, weirdly, I've got some of that old Super 8 stuff actually transferred and, and in HD now. Yeah. So probably, <laughs> oh, wow. Um, Brilliant. How did I miss that? That must be on one of the collections, is it? It is on one of the collections. Yeah. I can't remember which one. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll have to go back and have a look. There's so much stuff on those sets, which is incredible. Yeah. It's Stuart Manning and Richard Latto did a documentary. And once they'd, they'd interviewed yeah. me and we were doing this talk, they suddenly discovered, oh, right, okay, Mike's got this film and it's like, oh, well, we'll transfer it then. So it's lovely. It's just, nice, nice little bonus for you there. I've still got some of the models from it as well. I've still oh. got the cardboard TARDIS that I made from one of our films. Oh, wow. I've still got all the Eagle Transporter models that I've painted oh. up, the Airfix kit. From Space 1999. Yeah. Brilliant. So, Fantastic. So that was a start of it, really. Yeah. And then um, I was very lucky in that we had a neighbour who lived about six doors down from us who was head of drama at BBC Wales, uh, a gentleman called DJ Thomas. And he was best friends <laughs> with Michael John Harris at the BBC Visual Effects Department. Yeah. So he arranged a visit for me. So I went down and visited the effects department in 1980. How, um, how old were you then? Um, so I'm born 64, so I'm in my teens at this okay. point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, sort of 17... 16, 17. Yeah. And the effects department was making Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And I think I yeah. saw all the props and models for Warrior's Gate being made. Oh, and wow. They were brilliant. They sort of said to me, well, these are the sort of qualifications we're looking for. Mm. Um, and if you go to college and get these qualifications, then we have a, a system called a holiday relief placement. So staff in the effects department who want a two week summer holiday, we bring people in for two weeks unpaid see how of they course. do <laughs> um and I, I and i did my college course and then i got this call one year going we have holiday relief placements do you want to come in and that was it i came in mm. and i worked at the bbc in 85 um at which point of course <laughs> ironically doctor who was off the air oh of course <laughs> <laughs> um but the hiatus really the two-week yeah. placement turned into about a six-month contract with them. Mm. And right at the end of it, Doctor Who came back, and I worked on Mysterious Planet, the first part of Trial of a Time Lord. Right. So I ended up being involved in the big motion control sequence. At the yeah, the, the big Time Lord space station. Yeah, yeah. The space station. So that was my first um, involvement with Doctor Who. Wow. And then I did it... Oh, sorry, Paul, go ahead. I was going to say, I'll tell you, I, re I remember that because I, I was gutted in that year when they kind of held things over for, was it like 18 months or something, wasn't it? And, you know, like many Doctor Who fans at the time, it was kind of worried, like, is it, are they going to bring it back? And it's like, yeah, we're going to bring it back. It's all going to be fine. Don't worry. It's going to be bigger and better than ever. And you think, okay, hope so. And that that opening shot just floored me because suddenly it was like, oh, my goodness. Now, suddenly, Doctor Who looks as good as Star Wars does. And, you know, because I've, I've always loved Doctor Who, regardless of how great or whatever mm. the effects are. But, you know, when the effects are suddenly brilliant like that, it's like, yes, you know, you yeah, feel I mean, it. It's... It was a bit of a calling card for the effects designer, mm. Mike Kelt. Um, I mean, and don't get me wrong. I mean, the six months I was there, I wasn't just mm. twiddling my thumbs and being miserable because Doctor Who wasn't <laughs> on. Um, I would have been. <laughs> I, I was working on, yeah. you know, um, I did Galloping Galaxies. I did Tomorrow's oh, gosh, World. I, I did that. Top of the Pops. Yeah. Um, I did The Singing Detective. 
I was working on some fantastic program. Yeah. 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 Um, but there was this little bit in the back of my mind that going, well, I've arrived here too late for Blake seven doctor. Who's off the air, you mm, know? Yeah. Um, and then suddenly it was like, well, doctor who's back. And then star cops came along and, and of course, ultimately um, red dwarf yeah, yeah. came into that mix as well. But at the time it was just, I'm working in the department I've always wanted to work in. Mm. So it wasn't a, a fantastic thing to do. Um, and then the icing on the cake was, as I said, Doctor Who came along and Mike Kelt said, well, do you want to build some models for me? And I went, yes, I'd love to. And he goes, well, we need two new models of the TARDIS. Off you go. So so that's it. It's like, you know, um, I, I get to build a TARDIS. So, you know, five, six, seven years earlier, I was building cardboard ones in my bedroom. And suddenly I'm in the effects department building them for the show. So an extraordinarily lucky and... Um, just slightly mind blowing thing mm-hmm. to to have gone from this fan of the show to right I'm on the show now yeah yeah and and how old were you at that point because uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong yeah so you were almost straight out of of college yeah. then yeah. you know you got you know that the lucky call there and and you know obviously you had the the skills and the talent and everything and you know the, well, and the drive it's, and the it's an interesting one because um I always maintain I had all the enthusiasm and none of the experience. Yeah. So I, I arrived on Doctor Who with this, right, you know, I know how to yeah. do this, off yeah. I go. But I wish I could go back and do all those early shows with the experience I've got now. Yeah. Oh, really? In yeah. my late <laughs> because now I feel I know how to do the job. Back then, I just thought I knew how to do the job. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's probably, you know, that confidence is you know, it was probably key in a way to, you know, getting in and, you yeah. know. The um, arrogance of youth. Yes, yeah. There you go. <laughs> in a nice it, it way, a yeah. yeah. But I, th- I think also at, at that point, if, you know, you don't, you don't always know that there are certain barriers to things like barriers don't always exist. You know, it's mm. like, well, if I, if, if I do it, I'll do it. Whereas maybe someone who's older, who's probably done it loads of times and realized that well, you can't quite do it that way, you know, or we don't do it that way. Yeah. Whereas actually you're coming in, not knowing any of that, you just go ahead and do it in whatever yeah. way works. And you might, you know, you kind of disrupt and change things. And, and to be honest, that's one of the things I've loved about Dr. Who. It mm. never really sat back and went, Oh, I don't think we can do that. Oh, mm. brilliant. Yeah. They would look at their scripts and go, yeah, we'll have a crack at that we're going to do dinosaurs invading central london yes, we're going yeah. to do you know flooding dalek thousands of daleks in a in a cave being flooded we're going to do an invasion of earth we're going to do space battles we're going to take on they just went for it yeah and as you alluded to earlier when it works it works yeah. when it doesn't it doesn't but it's not for for lack of trying mm. yeah and we talked about this the other day paul didn't we that we did now you can't look at stuff you know from back then and and judge it on you know in comparison to today's effects and things and you know because like you said the ambition and the idea was there and it doesn't always work for for you know whatever the reason might be but the intentions there so you know do you know what i mean you kind of get caught yeah. up in the story of it and you know but at the same time i mean i can sit down and watch mm. something like um the Hand of Fear or Robots yeah. of Death or, or City of Death. And actually, I still respond really mm. well to all the model work that was being done because it's nicely designed, it's yeah. nicely shot. Mm. You know, okay, you know, you can go, it's a little crude by today's standards, but you also go, it could be a hell of a lot cruder. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. And at the actually, time, it was probably, you know, pushing the, you know, yeah. the envelope, wasn't it? So, yeah, you, exactly. you know, you, you, yeah, you can't judge it on, you know, today's and, stuff. And I think the design aesthetic mm. that's done of, of all those early 70s and early 80s shows is beautiful. I mean, yeah. you, you could take all those designs and put them back in the show now. And indeed, things like the Daleks and the Cybermen and Canine, all of the things from the classic show mm. that have been moved into the new prove that those old designs do work. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. It's interesting that you you brought up City of Death actually, because I remember seeing that there was it the the Jaggeroth spaceship, isn't it? I mean, that's a fantastic design, and you think, yeah. okay, yeah, like you said, you could go back and reshoot it and do whatever. In fact, I think again that there was a bit of a reshoot on the on one of the box sets, wasn't there? I think someone had done a, a was it model work? Was it CGI? I, I can't remember CGI anyway. CGI version. The CGI so, version, but it doesn't. Ex- yeah. Yeah, but it it doesn't bring anything new to what was already there. You know, yeah. it's like well, the model works fine. Yeah, there's, you know? there's I mean... a a charm and a you know 
We, well, there's it's, also, it's shot on 35 mil film. Yes. Yeah. It's shot by Nick Alder, you know, for God's sake, at Bray Studios with yeah, the yeah. the designer. You're not going to top that. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. That's it. Exactly. <laughs> and and it's like you said, the design aesthetic as well is just brilliant. It's, yeah. it, they could drop that into the new series quite yeah, easily yeah. and it would just. With very, very few nice. tweaks. I mean, mm. these days, all you'd do is you'd make the landscape and the model bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 you yeah. Would do really, yeah. I guess that's it. So you worked on the last few seasons of Doctor Who, then the the classic series, didn't you? Through Sylvester McCoy with Sophie Aldred and and, and Ace, and obviously you mentioned with the Time Lord spaceship with with Colin and everything else. So what 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 are what are the other highlights from working during that time? Then you know you mentioned the TARDIS having to design that. What what else have we got going on there for you? Well, it was. I mean, from my point of view, it was lovely because once I'd sort of. Um got on to Doctor Who, I then had, um, there were a lot of new guys coming into the department at the same time as me, all roughly the same age and all with a similar background. And what I've always maintained is that the effects department, I don't think, was quite ready for an influx of people who knew the work of the department. Mm. Up to that point, the department had just evolved. And now you were getting people who were fans of the work that the department had done. They were Doctor Who fans or Mm. like Seven fans. So myself and Alan Marshall and Paul McGuinness and Nick Cool, we were all coming into the into the department, um, and all of us were getting on to Doctor Who. And I think JNT as a producer recognised that there was this enthusiastic new young blood that he could actually right. use that enthusiasm. Yeah. So he really encouraged it, both with the effects crew and the writers. So John built up a really nice rep company of talent around him during Sylvester's three years. And I think by the time you get to Sylvester's final season with things like Curse of Fenric, you can see that that rep company is really gelling. Mm. Everyone knows each other's strengths and weaknesses, both from in front and behind the camera. We got on well with the actors. We got on well with the camera crew. And I wish we'd had another crack at doing another year because yeah. I think you'd have seen yet another jump in quality yeah. in that final year. Yeah. Well, what was it like when, you know, the show was cancelled at that time? How how did you all feel? Well, it was very sad. I mean, um, obviously, this, this show had been a huge part of our childhoods um, and, and a huge part of the BBC. Mm. And, and and in, in the latter years, a huge part of my career. I'd done mm. sort of four years of Doctor Who straight now. Um So the idea that it was gone and gone for good, uh, we thought, um, was actually quite sad. But you also have to bear in mind that at the same time, this new comedy series from BBC Manchester called Mm. Red Dwarf had come along. And as opposed to it being a old established 30 year old program or 25 year old program, this was something new um, and it allowed those of us who had the interest in science fiction, model making and prop making to sort of shift across. Yeah. And again, Peter Rag, who was the effects supervisor mm. um, or effects designer on Red Dwarf, he also identified, well, if I bring all these young sort of enthusiastic effects geeks onto <laughs> my show and let them loose, yeah, let's see what they do. And I mean, we were let, allowed to run riot on that (laughs) um you know we were doing ridiculous hours but we were also pushing the boundaries of Mm. what the bbc effects department had traditionally done because we wanted to do it yeah Mm -hmm. there were plenty of old lags in the department who were the best will in the world they were more interested in going out on location on things like last of the summer wine because (laughs) they were Without gentler. putting too fine a point on it, because that's where there was beer and women. <laughs> <laughs> um, they didn't want to be stuck in a workshop, yeah, picking parts onto a spacecraft model. Yeah. <laughs> we were the reverse, you know. We yeah. liked the beer and the women, <laughs> but we were quite happy staying in the sticking workshop bits on it, yeah. and <laughs> sticking bits on the model. So it worked very well for everybody in that um, we got to do stuff we wanted to do, and the, yeah. other, the older guys got to do what they wanted to do. Um, and it allowed us to sort of create a little bit of a mark in the department. So, mm-hmm. I mean, by the time we were doing Red Dwarf series five and six, you know, we'd both, we'd all been in the department six, seven years by that point. 
So we were starting to become established mm. and starting to learn our craft mm. that little bit better. What was the um, the the time frame on on everything? I, I don't know when Red Dwarf started. So did Doctor Who finish, and then Red Dwarf was? No, you there's a bit of an overlap. Right, there's okay. A bit of an overlap because um, I was working on um, sort of Ghost Light when um, Rocky was working on Red Dwarf series three. So, mm. so it yeah, going I think a little while. There's definitely an overlap there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what what was the um the, the uh, ambition and where you were sort of saying you know with Red Dwarf you got to kind of you know push it a little bit more make make your mark with it. What was the kind of budget situation there? Was it more than Doctor Who had, or was it less? Or um, it's not necessarily more than Doctor Who had. Mm. It's, it's it's a different um, scenario. Doctor Who every four or three episodes you have to create an entirely new world from scratch. Yeah. So there's no continuity of props or yeah. models. Red Dwarf, once we'd done season one, well, a model mm. of the Red Dwarf exists, Once you and the Scutters. Once you've done season two, well, now the Blue Midget model exists. Once you've done series three, now the Starbuck exists. So you build a library mm. of models that mm. can then be used in every subsequent season. Yeah. Whereas Doctor Who, you went from Curse of Fenric, which is a World War II drama, Okay, so all the props that we built for that are no use to us. No use Doctor next Who, time, yeah. yeah. No use to us on survival, and no use. So yeah. they're different scenarios. So you can't really compare budgets because there's mm. no continuity. Yeah. So would I guess you'd get given a budget on Red Dwarf, build what you needed, keep it, and then next year get more money, build new and stuff, you but you still more... got ac access to the old stuff. Right. Yeah. So you're yeah. not building a Starbug again from scratch. Yeah. Because you quite beneficial, got yeah. But you can yeah. build a new guest spacecraft, so you, yeah. you you build and build and build. So yeah, different scenarios on those mm. two shows. T tell us a little bit about uh, how you make the, the models, and you know what the design process is, and the structural, you know how you put them together. Because you know there's the famous, um, you know, egg cartons in in Star Wars and stuff like that. But ha ha yeah. Very simple question, but uh, you know, it's probably quite a big answer. But you know, how, how would you do it? How'd you do it? Well, again, I think there was a certain amount of there was a traditional way of doing stuff in the effects mm. department. I remember Matt Irvin saying to him, How big do I build the model? And he went, Big enough to get in the boot of a car. Mm, okay, and it's like, yeah. okay, because we have to drive to a studio, blah blah blah. Yeah, um. And when we were on Red Dwarf, it was like, well, can we go a bit bigger? Because we were always reading in the the film um, and television sort of journals and, and mm. any of that articles about what Industrial Light and Magic and the big film boys were doing. And it always struck me that the models that they built were always bigger. Mm. So it was a question of how big can we go? And one of the the things that made a huge difference for us on Red Dwarf was the effects department suddenly acquired or had built on the site a brand new model filming stage. Oh, okay. So instead of us having to take models in the back of a van mm. somewhere else to shoot, we could build in situ. And that opened up an awful lot of things for us. That yeah. allowed us to build quite big model sets, knowing that they didn't have to go anywhere. So we started to push the size of everything a little bit. Um, and Peter Rag, um, he was adamant from the beginning that although the show was a comedy, the effects yeah. shouldn't be comedic. Yeah. The, the the effects were there to serve the comedy, but should be yeah. done straight. Mm. So, and because his background was with Jerry Anderson on things like Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet, he taught us all of those techniques. All right. So, um, yeah. we, th there's a direct line from all the sort of Jerry Anderson shows now through to yeah. Red Bull. Which is oh, fascinating, wow. and it's I something that that. we yeah. only really looked back on in in latter years. At the mm. time, it wasn't something forefront in our minds. But when you look at it now, there is a linear yeah. progression through what Peter was doing in the latter Jerry Anderson shows through into Red Dwarf, and it it got us noticed. You know, it got the effects department noticed because people were going, "Did you see Red Dwarf? There's mm. an amazing Starbuck crash, or there's yeah. a spacecraft in it." And a lot of people were going, well, why can't we have that sort of effects work in Doctor Who? And, yeah. you know, and it's it's tricky because I said you 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 always have to sort of bear in mind that you know 
it's what designer you're working with, it's yeah. what production team you're working with, it's what budget they have. And and it's not always possible to do what mm. you want. Sometimes mm. you have to do what you have to do. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. I, I, I like that idea of having a kind of linear path through from the Jerry Anderson stuff right through to Red Dwarf. I'd, I'd never consider that. I think that's that, that's that's really quite something, isn't it? You know? and, and Alan Marshall, Rocky, mm. who is one of my sort of friends and colleagues from, from the, the BBC and still work with him today, he was adamant that if we're going to do Red Dwarf, he said, mm. like Thunderbirds, you know what the craft are instantly because Thunderbird yeah. 2 is green, Thunderbird 4 is yeah, white, Thunderbird true. 3 yeah. is orange. Yeah. So when we got to Red Dwarf, he goes, well, let's make the spacecraft colourful. Mm. Starbug is this green thing. Yeah, yeah. The Red Dwarf is red and the blue midget is blue. Let's yeah. follow that through. And so people will know instantly what the spacecraft is, yeah, even yeah. if it's a blur going through shot, because <laughs> it's the right colour, yeah. which is a completely opposite mentality to what Star Wars was doing with these big white and grey yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. heavily industrialised spacecraft. Mm. So you couldn't get away with a, with a Red Dwarf spacecraft in a, in a straight TV drama any more than I think you could have taken some of the spacecraft that were designed for Star Cops, mm. which are very based on NASA technology, yeah. and bung that back into Red Dwarf. The the two aren't the same. Yeah, yeah. The the, the universes are quite contained yeah, exactly. within their own, aren't they? Exactly. And there's there's a kind of a, a an aesthetic continuity within each one. I mean, but having said that, I mean you look at I mean Red Dwarf again, I think like you were saying, the 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 ambition seems to get bigger or seems yeah. to get bigger each season. Yes. And you can see it reflected in some of the, in in, in some of the just the just the sheer chutzpah of some yeah. of those effect shots. There, I mean, they're Again, incredible. There's a certain amount of you know we want to do it, therefore, mm. and we're young enough to think, well, we'll have a go at that, without thinking you're going to fail yeah, disastrously. Yeah. Um, but also, we sort of were starting to get a sense of what we knew we could do well and what was going to be a disaster or what was trickier. So mm. um, we were able to suggest to the writers at this point, why don't you do an episode with a lava planet? Because we know yeah. we can do a lava planet really well. And they would go, oh, okay then. <laughs> or we knew we could do snow really well, so they were yeah, snow yeah. episodes. I was, there's a great one, a Starbuck coming in over the, the a mountain with loads of snow and it was yeah. it marooned, isn't it? I think yeah, that the episode. Exactly. So yeah. having having done marooned when we knew mm. we could do snow, they they did another snow planet for quarantine because we knew we yeah, could do yeah. Oh wow, it's fantastic, isn't it? I, I love that. Did you did you rebuild the, the, the red dwarf model itself in the later series, the four or five or something? Did you or yeah, I mean, the original one was built externally for Series 1. It was built yeah. by an external model maker, um, which was something that was a bone of contention with us coming in as new mm. model makers because we kept saying, why are you putting all these models done that. out yeah. to external contractors? Mm. Um, so once they realised they had a team of people who wanted mm. to build them, that stopped. But that original Red Dwarf model, um, it didn't survive between seasons. It, it got stored badly and got destroyed. Yeah. So when we got to season five, uh, it was actually our cameraman on Red Dwarf, Peter Tyler. He built the Red Dwarf again from scratch. <laughs> Did he? Um, yeah. But at the end of that season, we had to blow it up again. So we ended up yes. with the Red Dwarf <laughs> again. Um, but by this point, we'd got so many stock shots of it traveling. Yeah. That it wasn't really an issue. So you probably didn't it's need only it. only when we needed very, very specific shots of the Red Dwarf that we needed a new model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's also one of those shows as well, I think, where... I, 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 would it have been CGI? Or was it optical effects that kind of enhanced the the, the model work? It's a um, bit early for CGI, wasn't it? It is early for CGI. So, so it's optical compositing for the motion yeah. control work, which is all shot on film, and then the mm. film you shoot a beauty pass, a light pass, a matte pass, a background pass, and then the optical printer puts it all mm. together. Yeah. Um, or you were using video effects technology, Harry and Quantel system. Mm. Um, so yeah, the the CG really didn't start to come along until about series seven, um, and and that's that's true of Doctor Who as well. I mean, there's yeah, very little yeah. CG in Doctor Who in the first in the classic run, mm, yeah. um, if any. I mean, I think Time and the Rani is the only show that actually has computer generated. Yeah, shot, yeah. Um, of the TARDIS at the beginning, mm, right at the start of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Um, yeah. So yeah, CG wasn't even a you know an option at this point in the no. series. So you know it didn't impact on us at all. Mm. Yeah. I'm trying to think. I used to watch Red Dwarf, but <laughs> I I can't. I, I it's been a while, been, is it? Yeah, <laughs> it has been. Yeah, <laughs> but I can clearly picture you know the ships and. And yeah. for some reason, uh, is it Dwayne Dwayne Dibley? Dwayne Dibley, uh, oh, yeah, Dibley. St- <laughs> sticks in my mind. Yeah, but you, this, you... I mean, this is another thing. I mean, um, we're not just doing the model work; we're also doing all of the on-set practical effects. Oh, well, of I, was, course. I was thinking about Crichton. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, yeah. Did... Um, we did the Crichton masks. Yeah. Yeah. Did the scutters. Um, we're doing the pyrotechnics. We're doing yeah. the, the hand props. Um, it's it's a lot of work because it's everything that you get from a science fiction show mm. and everything you get from a comedy mm. swooped together. Yeah, yeah, it's quite and, unusual, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and is, all is, done by about eight people. Yeah, <laughs> is it is it true that you played Crichton's love blob Camille? I did indeed. It's, did um, <laughs> usual thing if you build the thing, step it, it in there. It's, <laughs> best, it's best for the effects crew to operate it. Yeah. yeah. But yes, I played um, Camille Blob and Nick Cool played Hector Blob. Um, and, uh, so yeah, I spent um, two days at Shepard yeah. Studios underneath a, a quivering piece of KY jelly covered latex. <laughs> There's not many jobs that you can say you've done that in, is there? Yeah. Uh, mate, you design the blob, you build the blob, you become the blob, you yeah. are the blob. Get in the blob, mate. Just get so, in there. Rocky and, and Nick and I would do small monsters, yeah. and Paul McGuinness being tall and thin. You six they foot. Do the big ones, they? Skinny. He'd do Mutton Vindaloo Monster and the Silence. <laughs> yeah, I remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine it must have been a riot on that show. I mean, lots of hard work for sure, but yeah, I mean, I the, the entire thing was good fun. I mean, mm. um, the entire culture at the BBC was one of work hard, play hard, very mm. much so. Mm. But yeah. it's a purpose built workshop. Um, next to a tube line with yeah, a canteen yeah. with its own bar you know <laughs> um so there was a fair amount of get to work early get breakfast work hard get lunch stay to the evening go for a couple of pints in the bar go home repeat yeah. um yeah. but at the time as i said from my point of view i'd transferred my hobby to my job mm. so i i was more than happy to spend all my time at the effects department it was brilliant absolutely yeah brilliant. yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I love that that yeah you turned your hobby in, into your job you know N- not not everyone gets to do that do no, they? No, yeah. no. I, i'm incredibly lucky and i'm very aware of it yeah that's amazing um one of our questions was what what was a favorite moment from red dwarf and i'm wondering if it's been a quivering ky jelly blob <laughs> <laughs> it's tricky because i mean there are so many great moments in yeah. there but um i mean i loved doing um the asteroid sequence from series six in Sirens. In fact, oh, Sirens yeah. is a favorite show on yeah. all sorts of levels. I mean, I got to design the monster for that. Um, so that was that was great. Um, we were basically told, can you do an asteroid sequence like Empire Strikes Back? Yeah. And make yeah. It our best shot. And I got to meet Jenny Agatha. So, you know, it's, it's a <laughs> lot of pluses, really. <laughs> and and do you know what I like about that asteroid because I, I I can see it in my in my head there is because it is as big and bold as the Empire Strikes Back, but you have you seem to have a lot of fun with it as well. There's some some slightly dodgy maneuvers that yeah. they, you know, yeah. which are just brilliant and yeah. handbrake it's, noises and things like that, which yeah, I think exactly. is great because you are making a comedy, you know. Yeah. Um, but it, it's back to what Peter said about the effect shouldn't be funny. Mm. The effects mm. serve the comedy, not are the comedy. Mm. Yeah, yeah, which is which is interesting because I, I wonder if they had that that same idea in Hitchhiker's Guide. Actually, thinking about it, it was obviously quite a lot earlier, um, because again, even though the, the the effects in that are a little bit more primitive, it being sort of what 1980, 81, I think, wasn't it? Um, they nonetheless seemed to really go for it. You know, yeah. they wanted the scale. They they wanted those models to to really. And, work and I for think the show. you know, take it up to I was going to say present day, but it's still a few years, if not decades, mm. old. Galaxy Quest, all the effects in yeah, Galaxy yeah. Quest are top notch. They're not trying to do funny spacecraft. No, that's mm. it. Mm. Yeah, and the again, Cali- just. just Sorry, just just back to Hitchhikers. I have to say as well, what's that ship? The, the Heart of Gold, isn't it? The original yeah. BBC. Forget about the film version. The the BBC version. Yeah. The Heart of Gold is 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 iconic. I think. I, I think all the designs that Jim Francis did in the BBC version are great. Definitely. And, and, yeah. and again, I think it's not just Hitchhiker and Doctor Who. Blake mm. Seven, the Tripod, Star Liberator, Cop, they've all got yeah. fantastic oh, design work. Yeah. Fantastic design work. 
Yeah, there's, there's, there's been a lot of um, tweets I've seen actually on tripods because I think it was uh, it's an anniversary of when it started or something, isn't it? Do you see those, Jeff? Yeah, I did because um, yeah, someone shared a picture of it, yeah. and, and I said, I said I didn't know what it was, and I, I mm. assumed it was War of the Worlds, and I said, oh, the Tom Cruise ah, film is, right. is great. I don't know if you've seen it, but the bit where the first um, tripod comes comes out in the street and it wrecks <laughs> everything is astonishing. Fantastic. And, and it's an incredible sequence. And um, the, the guy on Twitter mm. said, no, this is the tripods, not War of the Worlds. <laughs> and I was like, what? It's, and, he, and he said, whoever wrote the tripods later said, I've never seen or heard of War of the Worlds. And I, <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> yeah, so like I must have heard the of same. War of the yeah. John, was it John, John Christopher who wrote it, wasn't it? John Christopher, he, that's yeah, right. He, he would yeah. definitely know that. But that, that's one of those shows that, you know, I, I, I'm i still carrying the pain from the fact that they cancelled yeah, Series 3. It was all two and never made Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and I think they said, didn't they, if, if they were going to do Series 2, they were only going to do Series 2 if they got the go-ahead for Series 3. And the BBC were like, yeah, yeah of course, yeah, you got, you got both of those. We love it. It's very popular go and do it and they're like yes and of course series two ends on a massive cliffhanger jeff because yep. you know and we're all waiting for series three and it's like and that's the end of the tripod it's oh, like what no, no you oh, can't do that frustrating <laughs> and i've been carrying that in my head ever since and i'm not the only one as i found out in my twitter community earlier. <laughs> Sorry, slight digression there, but um, but actually, do you know those are good effects as well, aren't they? The, the the big leg coming down, they they were really starting to push things out back in. Back yeah, back again, they're using Quantel and Paintbox, things. and so again, not CG mm. but early electronic effects to try and you know really push the level of what you can do. And you know, again, kudos to Steve Druitt and his team for 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 just doing. Again, mm. I, I, I'm, I'm I'm repeating myself, but <laughs> n- not having the ambition. Yeah curtailed by sitting there and going oh i don't think we can do it it's the mm. fact that you're like no that's what the script asks for we'll have a damn good mm. trial yeah exactly yeah, yeah. and yeah. you know sometimes it might not quite work but the, the try and, and the fact being given the license to try yeah. almost you know well, and if it doesn't it. work work out why it didn't work yeah. and try and do it better next time well so much stuff just you know it, it wouldn't happen or wouldn't be what it is if people just say, oh, well, we can't do that, so let's yeah, not exactly. try. You know, exactly. you, you, you wouldn't have groundbreaking effects mm. and things yeah. like that happening, you know. So, um, Mike, when, um, you know, Doctor Who and, and things finished, I, I guess you became quite good friends with people because, um, of, you know, in the 90s, you, you worked with Sophie Aldred on, on the Ace uh, book, didn't you? Yeah. Um, so, you know, how, how did all that come about? And, you know, I, yeah, was it... it a good friendship with her and you know what, what was that yeah like? i mean we'd become very good friends on the show mm. um and we had all these we were always taking photographs on set um so after the show finished we we were saying we've got this fantastic record of the making of this television program yeah. over three years we should do something with it and at the time um virgin books were doing the um the new adventures or mm-hmm. just picked up doctor who publishing um and so sophie and i just approached them um you know unsolicited and went hi um <laughs> we've got all these um behind the scenes photos and yeah. we were we were there on set for um pretty much the entire thing and stories i wasn't around for mm-hmm. sophie was and vice versa um, can we do this behind the scenes book? And um, they jumped at it. I was going to say, yeah, you must have snapped your arm off for that one. It, it was a it was a lovely thing to do. Mm. And then that in turn meant that I now had access to a, a publisher, <laughs> and <laughs> they said, well, you know, is there anything else you'd like to do? And it was like, well, I've always wanted to do fiction. Mm. Um, and they were doing short story collections at the time. The decalogue, oh, yeah, decalogue, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I got to write for decalogue too. And then I did pitch quite a few novels at Virgin Books over the years mm. um, to no avail uh, <laughs> until finally the BBC took yeah. back over the the publishing range of Doctor Who with mm. the advent of the Paul McGann TV movie. Uh, and um, I pitched again and, and got um, myself and my writing partner, Robert Perry, we pitched... Yeah. Um, and were picked up for one of the six launch titles. So and that's where Illegal Alien came Illegal from. Alien, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And that started a role of sort of fiction writing that sat alongside my effects career, mm. dipping occasionally in and out of more factual books along yeah. the way, the, the 
history of the effects department that I did with Matt and uh, Impossible Worlds that I did with Stephen Nichols. So yeah, there's it, it right place, right time, and yeah, um, it, it's the usual thing. It's like. <laughs> In some ways, that was a question of right. You know, I know mm. I can get a manuscript onto somebody's desk this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did now, Did you have um, <laughs> Did you have a few stories? I mean, you said you always wanted to write fiction. Did you have some stories that you always wanted to write for Doctor Who? Did, you know, or did you develop Illegal Alien? Was that from scratch? Or no, that from... that's something I'd always wanted to do. Robert mm. and I had come up with this idea, and it, it it just happens to suit what they wanted. But um, inevitably, the way that um, most pitches work from that point on is you pitch what you'd like to do and the producers tell and the, the publishers tell you what mm. they want and the two don't always meet okay yeah. so quite often you're pitching two or three stories and they're picking the ones that they want mm. i think there's a a little bit of a myth that you just go in with here is my you know fantastic <laughs> story in a finished form and yeah off you go but in fact what you get is an awful lot of back and forth of oh you you've submitted a a historical we want something set in far future or you've submitted a present day where we'd like a historical so there's a lot of um give and take on these mm. things and um you've got to work with your editors basically yeah yeah i think this uh, i mean that that's illegal alien there isn't that's it and that, that yeah. features just looking at the cover there that features an old sort of second doctor cyberman was yeah. that was that in your, in, in your pitch it was it, you yeah. wanted that look for the for the cyberman yeah, definitely. We wanted um, a slightly older mm. feel, a slightly creepier version of the Cyberman yeah, yeah. than the more verbose versions that had turned up in the in the um, in the eighties. I'm I'm a huge fan of the Troughton um, stories. Yeah. Moonface and I wondered um, if you were. Weird yeah. in space. I mean, they yeah. they they they're, they're creepy and they're chilling. Yeah. Um, and the 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 novelization of the Moonbase by Jerry Davis. I mean. A, it's got some great writing, but it's got mm. some really creepy illustrations as well. And we wanted to bring right. back some of that um, that feel of these these hulking great things. Mm. Um, whereas by the time you get to um, Earthshock and onwards, um, with no you know disrespect to David Banks and all the rest of them, they're much chattier Cybermen. <laughs> <laughs> they are, which gives them a slightly different kind of feel, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. completely you, different feel. Yeah. Did you have a, was there Cybermats in here? I apologize because I yeah, haven't read it for, for quite a while, well. wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think I remember that. Yeah. You you wrote um you wrote a couple that I I really love. Uh, Nightmare of Black Island and the and the uh, Crawling Terror as well. Mm -hmm. And there's there's little horror feel to both of those, isn't there? Well, my favourite Doctor Who has always been when... I always think Doctor Who works best when it's being a horror series, oh. not a science fiction <laughs> or a fantasy series. I, I'm just going to say in there, quite often when we're... Uh, we, like, we've done a podcast episode about our favourite books and our favourite audios, and I always say I love a spooky yeah, Who. Too. So, yeah. you know, that that kind of stuff. Like, like... So, so for me, Brain of Morbius, um, mm. Talons of Wang Chiang, um, uh, Seeds of Doom, Hand of Fear... You know, image of the Fendal, anything that's sort of spooky English horror, folk tale stuff. Yeah. Can't go wrong as far as I'm concerned. I, um, I say, um, if you've got any more ideas in that vein, let, let's get them written because, you know, I, yeah. I'll read them like right now. <laughs> but again, as I said, you know, I can pitch as many of these as mm. you like, but if they turn around and go, we want, you know, uh, a comedy set in outer space. Yeah, that's yeah. what you write. <laughs> that's, that's what happens. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what it's got to be. They try and match the writer to the project, obviously. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's not always in your control. No. Um, mm. But yes, I mean, I'm very, very pleased with things like Nightmare of Black Island. That was um, um, me, sort of really, I think, finding my feet as a solo writer. Mm. Mm. Um, and then Crawling Terror was was a joy to do. I mean, mm. I really enjoyed just playing with taking Capaldi's Doctor, but writing him as Pertwee. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, how, how did um, it, it work uh, for both of those? Because I know like sometimes, uh, you know, the books are commissioned and the, and the series is still being filmed and the scripts are only half finished or, you know, the, you know whatever it might be. So I can't, I can't remember what series each of those books came out with, but did you get quite a good, you know, uh, understanding of, of each version of the Doctor? Because it's 10 and, and 12 in them, isn't it, with Clara um, in... in yeah, um... 
the 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 tenant one was easier because I'd been working on on the series, so I'd seen yeah. him in action, and I I sort of knew how he was going to write. And of course, Rose we'd seen for an entire year anyway. Yeah. Um, so that was relatively straightforward. Um, nine, um, Crawling Terror was harder because mm. um, no, that was written without having seen any Capaldi. Right. All. all right. Um, so again, I just took Terence Dix's advice to heart, which is you just write for the doctor and then the actor will bring what they mm. want to it. Yeah. So by writing the doctor, by the time the book came out, people had already seen Capaldi. So yeah. I hoped that they would just map his performance onto my words. Yeah, I, th- <laughs> I think you're right. Because quite a lot of the, the books, if if you didn't... Uh, you know, have a picture of a doctor mm-hmm. on the front, and and you just read it, and it was uh, descriptionless. You, you know, you just kind of project your your favourite on, wouldn't you? Yeah. I think well, you know. I remember as a kid, my local library had a copy of Doctor Who and the Zabi, but it had Tom Baker yeah. on the cover. Oh wow! It was just like that cover. because yeah. they didn't care it was a Hartnell story. Tom <laughs> yeah, the right. Doctor. So I read it thinking, well, okay, I'll I'll yeah. just read this new Doctor Who story then. Yeah. But you're right. I think <laughs> you as the as the reader do an awful lot of the work on our behalf in some yeah. ways of, yeah. of putting the right doctor in the place. Yeah. I, yeah. I, uh, I, I'm going to confess here. I used to do this when I was a kid because I, I I read the Target novels so many times over. There was, there was a period I went through where I would read one and just imagine one of the different doctors doing yeah. the whole thing, you know, like the Armageddon factor with uh, with the fifth doctor and, and stuff like that, Earthshock with Patrick Troughton. Well, it kind of arguably, works. You know what I mean? And arguably the series has done it in that you take mm. something like Human Nature by Paul Cornell, yeah, exactly. which has been written for yeah. Sylvester's Doctor, yeah. ends up on screen for Tenant. <laughs> yeah. Doctor, you know? I quite like that. Maybe there's a maybe there's a challenge in there. Take a book and change the <laughs> yeah. doctor. Change yeah. the doctor around. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And of course you, you wrote some some brilliant big finish audience mm. as well, didn't you? Genocide machine, dust breeding. Yeah, early big finish, sort of early days of the company. I think I'm yeah. running seven and twenty one with those two. So that's <laughs> fifteen or sixteen years ago now. Oh, gosh. Um, it's a while ago, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It, it is going back a while. But yeah, again, done because Gary Russell, who was the mm. sort of editor in charge of the the range at that point, he knew that I'd written for Sophie and Sylvester, and he, he knew that I was friends with Sophie and Sylvester. So he said, "Well, we figure that you'll just get their voices and their characters." Yeah. yeah. So, and then I got the added bonus of getting their first Dalek story, which is lovely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah. Any any more plans to do any more Big Finish or, or any other books at all? You, you know, you There's always look... stuff bubbling under. Um, I'm always pitching <laughs> stuff. I've got a pitch in the system at the moment. I'm just waiting to hear. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, yeah, mm. you, you probably can't tell us anymore, can Not you? a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so just, just going slightly back in time, um, well, we're kind of on the right level, I suppose, aren't we? So um, BBC, the BBC effects department closed in early 2000s? 2005. 2005. So following that, you went to, you set up your own company, right? The, the model unit, is that right? Yeah. So um, the BBC was closing down everything. So um, costume and set and basically it was all the the production departments were going and the effects department was part of that. What was the Um, reasoning behind that? There's all sorts of politics involved with it, not Mm. being cost effective, um, producers wanting to use outside facilities, not enough shows needing effects work anymore just because of the changing landscape. A lot of stuff that I could argue for or against Mm, yeah yeah i'm not going to get into the politics of it Mm -hmm. but the point was quite wise (laughs) yeah the the decision was made Mm. but um my manager at the bbc um a gentleman by the name of nick saint and clark had just secured a massive gig for the effects department both Mm. digital guys and the the model making guys to do a, a show for itv called extraterrestrial Ah. It was basically a two-part right. big landmark series on life on alien worlds. And he went, well, if you close down the department, I've got nobody to do the work. Mm. Um, so they agreed to keep me on, and I formed a one-man unit called the BBC Post-Production Model Unit. And that model unit did extraterrestrial, then went and did um, Hiroshima documentary yeah. at the BBC, and we pitched 
for Doctor Who. This is when the revived series was just announced. Just as they've closed down the effects department, Mm. Doctor Who comes back. (laughs) So we pitched as a joint effort between the BBC digital effects department Mm. and me, and the digital effects guys didn't get it. It, um, The mill got the effects. Um, And then I popped around to the mill, uh, and the, the guy who was running it at the time was a gentleman by the name of Dave Throssell. And Dave said, no, he said, I think it's essential that we have a miniatures unit working alongside us. Mm. So he was um, instrumental in getting me to a production meeting. Um, and so we did season one, effectively. Mm. Rose, Aliens of London, um, Parting of the Ways, yeah. um, Empty Child, all of that was still mm. done under the auspices of the BBC, right, under yeah. my little one-man model. Mm. And then at the end of that, we too were closed down, not just me, but the digital effects department at the BBC as wow. well. And at that point, that's when I set up my own version of the company. Mm. Um, and I ran that for another 15 years, sort of based at Ealing Studios. Right. Um, um, just slightly uh, detour for a moment. What what did you think when you heard who was coming back? <laughs> and you know what, what was your feelings? Well, my feeling was fantastic. This will be a brilliant thing to work mm. on. This technology has moved on so far. Um, and also, oh, I know the um, showrunner because I went to school with him. Oh, um, really? I, went, I went to school with Russell. He no. Was two ahead of me, yeah. <laughs> so um, I dug out Russell's email address, or I, yeah. I managed to find Russell's email address, and I, I just emailed him out of the blue and basically went, hi. Hoping uh, he had changed his email. Remember me. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, so that that was again just being yeah. on my behalf um and it was a lovely thing to do and um and i said with thanks to dave throssell at the mill um yeah. they went okay yeah we can see that there's going to be some miniature effects work again as well and then it was a question of trying to sort of work out what we could do within the budget available yeah, yeah. um and then from my point of view how can i push doctor who effects into a slightly mm. bigger arena which is why you know rose was lovely for me because that nesting lair that we blow up at the end mm. you know it was a sixth scale model it's it's huge uh, by by old yeah, yeah. Standards. um and we just kept pushing it so season one was um big learning curve for everybody mm. um but produced some fantastic stuff i'm, I'm very proud of the fact that you know the trailer for, for Doctor Who season one has got the big Ben shot yeah. in it, yeah. got the Dalek in it, uh, and then we end the series with the Dalek Emperor. We've got the the barrage balloon sequence with Billy. It's a lot of really nice iconic yeah. stuff, yeah. really neat mm-hmm. stuff to do. Um, and yeah, that was that was great. And then um, I think the last thing we did for Doctor Who under the old BBC banner. Mm. was Christmas Invasion, so Tenant's first story. Right. And by the time we get to um, School Reunion, I think that's... I, th- I think School Reunion was literally the last thing we did under the BBC banner. Mm. Right, and then it was... And then, and it was then your... the model unit set up. Yeah, when right, really yeah. One of our first jobs was Tooth and Claw, which even though those two shows went in a different order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it was fairly seamless for me going from BBC to... To, to sort of private company because I've mm-hmm. effectively been running my own company for a year to 18 months within the BBC system. Right. Yeah. So yeah, yeah that, that transition worked well. Yeah. yeah I've, I've seen some of the, uh, the models at, um, you know, like the Doctor Who exhibition and uh, or experience and cause that, that started as there was a, they did one in London, didn't they? And then it moved to Cardiff and, and they, yeah. they, there was a touring version for a bit that, yeah. um, and there was an happened. exhibition in Brighton at the end of um, yes. one, the end of the period. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. I, I didn't do that, which is annoying now because I'm quite close <laughs> to Brighton. Um, yeah. And and then um, I would have seen stuff, I'm sure, at like the 50th celebration and, and yeah. the uh, mini yeah. event they did with you know during Capaldi's time as well. So, like you were saying about the size of, of mm-hmm. you know the things there, it's not until you actually see them that that you realise you know they're called miniatures, but 
that they're not <laughs> really are they you know at all uh, yeah. so it's it's quite nice having seen them for for real yeah. it's, it's, well there, there's um there's a picture of you working on the big Ben, which i think i saw in doctor who magazine when it was all you know when it was all kicking off in 2004-5 and you're you're standing up mm. as you're yeah. carving mm. you know sculpting it aren't you and, and yeah. yeah which is which is something I mean, I mean, again just you know a lovely thing to do and mm. and and again, trying to push the boundaries just that little bit. Yeah, yeah that, that yeah. shot is... Uh, it's iconic. It is, it is iconic. Now, am I right in thinking there's there's something was flopped? Yeah. Um, with those shots in that sequence? Because of the, <laughs> the nature of the way that thing went, mm -hmm. when we filmed the model work, we were under the impression that the, the ship would be coming in from the left of frame and it's the left wing that that hits Big Ben. Mm, yeah. And by the time we got to the final edit, the ship was coming in from the right of frame, and it's the right wing. So they had to flop um, our model shots to match everything around it. Right. Yeah. Um, which unfortunately means that the clock face is the wrong way around. Yes. Because um, luckily, um, the Roman numerals that are on, mm. on the, the, the clock face of Big Ben are quite ornate. So it's not immediately apparent. No. Um, but it is annoying because we'd gone to all the trouble. Yeah, the yeah. clock was at the right time of day for the yeah, show. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah. You're so um, sort of focusing on the on the wing and the destruction, yeah. aren't you? That, yeah, you'd have to take a couple of views to go, oh, hang on, you know. And, the, and that's the, the um, mm. either the benefit or the downside of the modern world is that nothing <laughs> one-off view anymore everyone's got yeah. copies of it <laughs> yeah, of it and yeah. screen grabs and, yeah. Down and yeah. still frame it and frame grab it so yeah yeah but still, I mean that 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 sequence in itself, that shot, it's it's like a mission statement mm. for the series that yes, that follows. Exactly. So was was that and it, was that in your mind, ever in your mind when when you were no, this, on this, this comes from Russell. I mean, Russell mm. was like, if the show is coming back, it's big, it's bold, and and you know, we are Doctor Who. It's going mm. to be in London. It's going to be you know, mm. landmarks that you see being yeah, destroyed. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, yeah. You know, Russell was very very clear on if this show is coming back, it can't come back with a whimper. No, oh, it's got it comes be back big. with an absolutely massive yeah. statement of we well, are did it ever. so it's shots of the doctor and rose running across west westminster yeah. bridge yeah. where you use all these london landmarks and, mm. yeah. you know, and it worked for him it became huge very quickly yeah every time i see the london eye now i think of uh yeah eccleston <laughs> going where yeah. is it where is it and yeah. you know the framing right behind him and the the you know radar waves yeah. or whatever it is coming out you know so, so it's 20 years later and i'm still yeah, thinking all this all this is driven by russell yeah that's brilliant yeah, yeah. so oh sorry paul go ahead no i, I was just going to close that off actually just by saying again it's really nice because you kind of bridge the old series mm. with the new series you, again you're bringing that continuity through aren't you with um you well, know what's even experience. nicer is that one of my assistants on doctor Who season one and indeed mm. going with me right the way through to matt smith on um time of the doctor is colin mapson and oh colin right yeah, yeah was my effects designer on yeah. time of Rani, and in <laughs> turn had been an effects designer on invasion of time the hands of fear so colin and he he was yeah. an assistant on the green death operating the oh, map wow. Yeah, well, so Colin's right back. continuity on this mm. is somebody who worked with Pertwee ended up working with Matt Smith, you know, and everyone in between. So oh, I love that brilliant. fact that we've got this old timer who's gone from being <laughs> my boss, yeah, to me being his boss. Um, <laughs> but it, it was it's just lovely, and and so yeah. Colin's work is exemplary, and for him to be on my team was just mm. a really nice thing to have. That's great. So tell us a little bit about Day of the Doctor and uh, the yeah. work on that and, and winning your BAFTA. How was that? Well, we hadn't worked on the show for some time and we, we, we'd we barely done more than one or two mm. um, episodes with, with David. Uh, and then when the production team changed over, when Stephen Moffat took over and um, Marcus Wilson came in as producer, I thought, well, okay, there's a there's a new production team. They don't know me from Adam. I'll just drop a line and go, hi, this mm. is what we do. This is what we have done. Is there anything coming up that might be of interest? And uh, Marcus um, phoned me and he said, well, actually, yeah. He said, we've got a submarine story coming up, um, which we're thinking of doing miniatures. So why don't we have a chat? And that led to me doing the work on Cold War. 
That's one of my. I love that. Um, so we were talking about that yesterday, Paul. With, were, with yeah, another, yeah. another another pod, podcast. Yeah, another yeah. podcaster. And uh, I yeah, I really like that episode. It's great. So, a fantastic episode for me as a calling card. Yeah, yeah. Theme. And then at the end of that, they said, "Well, we've got the fiftieth anniversary coming up, and there's this big war sequence at the beginning." can we send you a script? Mm. And then the script arrived and it's like, it's all fantastic. And then I read the dreaded words and in 3d. Mm. Um, <laughs> so yeah. we had to do um, a little bit of sort of proof of concept testing to make sure that what we were attempting to do was actually going to be feasible. Was it, was it filmed in 3d or converted? It, it, it no, was filmed in 3d. Right. Okay. And the whole episode itself. Yep. Everything's oh, wow. filmed with mm. um, uh, full 3D rigs. Right. Um, wow. So there's a massive, massive technical challenge then in what can be done and how practical it is to shoot. Mm. So I had to work out whether we could shoot model work in high speed um, in 3D. Wow. Uh, and yeah. what scale the models would need to be. And, uh, you know, because quite often with model work we're forcing perspectives and things yeah. but if you do a forced perspective that relies on a 2d viewpoint for it to work so there were all sorts of technical um mm. considerations and we had a very very good um 3d um sort of consultant called adam, adam Skull, skullthorpe and we shot some tests yeah. uh, actually using the old dalek emperor model from eccleston's first series and that was a proof of concept that mm. yeah how big the models needed to be and also i was aware that there had been a lot of model work done in 3d for the feature film hugo oh yeah um, particularly there's a big train crash um, yeah yeah um so i read up an awful lot about that and i said well they're using exactly the same camera rig as us and their models are this scale therefore i think this is doable mm. so um that gave us the confidence then to go right we're doing the scene of the TARDIS coming through the wall, yeah. into all the yeah, darlings yeah. flying away, <laughs> and the Time Lord sort of ACAC gun yeah. down and getting blown up. So those were our big sequences. Um, but because the 3D cameras were tricky to get hold of, it meant that we could only film on a weekend in a gap where the live action unit wasn't shooting. So they, they shot for two, two weeks, then they had a weekend off, then they shot for another two weeks, another week. So we had to shoot our model work in one of those weekend gaps. Oh, right. um, but it also meant that we had to shoot our model work before yeah. they shot the live action. <laughs> so we it's were so... working very, very closely with the art yeah. department on, well, this is what your paint finish is going to be. Okay, well, this is the wall that the Daleks are going to smash through. So uh, we're going to have this little bit of detail. Yeah. And okay, well, then we'll copy that full size on the set. So a lot of back and forth, um, wow. but it paid off because it's a lovely sequence. Mm. Um, and then that in turn mm. informed us as to how we were going to do the effects um, building on that. It's what I was saying to you earlier. You do something, you learn, you build on it. Yeah, the yeah. Effects yeah. That we then did for time of the doctor sort of, um, blowing up trends of law at the oh, end. Yeah. Yes. Um, that built on all the work that we'd done on Day of the Doctor, but without mm. the added complication. The 3D. 3D. Mm. Yeah. What's it like when you spend all this time and an effort making a you know highly detailed model looks fantastic, and then you blow it up and it's, done, <laughs> it's over in like a second? You shoot it slow mo, so it looks you know, it takes ages on screen. But what? A, I constantly sort of um, tell people at talks is that the model is not the end result for us. Mm. The, the effect on screen is the end result. The model right. is the means to getting there. Yeah, yeah. So I'm never disappointed if the model gets blown up as long as the footage looks fantastic. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'd that's be a, disappointed that's... if we blew it up and the footage was crap. <laughs> the fo <laughs> focus was wrong. <laughs> yeah, but if the footage you get back is fantastic, yeah. then the model was just the means of getting the footage. Yeah. And it's it's yeah. why I keep saying we're not model makers, we're effects men. Effects, yeah. And if you it's... come in as a model mm. maker, you have to realize that the model is not the end result. Yeah, that's it's a only that's part a, of it, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's a lovely way of looking at it. Yeah, yeah. yeah like right you're saying with, with the lighting and yeah. and, the, and the cameras and the mm. angle of the cameras and the exactly. frame rates and whatever motion you're going to program into them or whatever it is, all of that. 
is part of the mix. Yeah. So you work with your cameraman and mm. your lighting directors. You work with what the live action crew have done to make sure that our lighting yeah. matches their lighting. So there's a constant back and forth. Well, I say there's a constant back and forth. <laughs> when it works well, there's a constant back and forth. I was going to say, there must be times when it kind of breaks down a little yeah. bit. Then the whole but when it works chaos. well, yeah. everyone is feeding information back and forth to each other. And Time of the Doctor was a beautiful experience mm. for us because yeah. we we were able to deliver model shots that cut in with the live action to the point where some people don't know where the live action ends and the model work starts. So now I'm thinking yeah. about it, yeah. yeah but the best sort, of, best sort of effects. We, you, yeah. know, you don't know that CG, you don't know it's a model. Yeah, you know, and that to me is, is where the industry should be, where mm. your physical effects, your creature effects, your CG effects and your miniature effects guys are all working as one team to create a fantastically seamless end result mm -hmm. and your audience is kept guessing as to how it's been achieved it's done, yeah. because every time you cut it might be a different technique you're looking mm -hmm. at um and i think you can if you're not careful go down the route of doing everything one way and you might get a little bit of overkill mm -hmm. i said time of the doctor was a very very good experience for me so was that the last bit of Doctor Who work that you did, or did you do some stuff during Capaldi's? We and, and did one Joe... Capaldi episode. We did Thin Ice, which was a oh, shot yes. from, oh, yeah. um, when he jumps through the ice after Bill yeah. um, mm. in his um, diving suit. We built a one-third scale puppet of Peter Capaldi in oh, the suit. Yeah. And <laughs> then uh, it was shot in a water tank uh, at Danny Hargreaves' effects facility in Cardiff. Yeah. And we did a wax and fiberglass sort of ice surface. Mm. Um, very good underwater camera team. And so they got the shot of, of the puppet just smashing through the ice and coming past. So that was um, that was a lovely um, sort of very, very brief effect sequence, but yeah. a, an important effect sequence within the story. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, from my point of view, a lovely thing to do because... I got to work with um, a sculptor called Stephen Mansfield, who did yeah. the portrait head of Capaldi. Um, and um, Stephen had been one of the sculptors during the McCoy era, and he'd done things uh, like right. the Sequoia and the Heat. Oh, really? Yeah. So to bring him back into the fold again, again was yeah. fantastic. So yeah. really, really nice one. So that's our swan song on Doctor Who. Right, oh, okay. Oh, that's brilliant. But you did work on um, on Sharda, the Sharda restoration yes. animation, didn't you? Yes. Now, that that was an absolute dream project. I bet. Because <laughs> as, as a kid who'd grown up watching yeah. Tom, um, to get to do a Tom Baker story and to get to do it in the style that it would have been done because mm. uh, I'd, I'd been I'd been in the effects department um, when the original effects designer of Sharda, Dave Havard, had still been yeah. alive. So I knew Dave very well. Um, and I knew how he would have done a lot of these shots. So to go back and recreate all of Dave's models yeah. and actually literally go and do a model shoot in exactly the same style as it would have been done in 1979 yeah. was fantastic mm. and really really pleased with the end result um i actually think it's a really good um way of completing that story i think the animation yeah. works i think the fact mm. that they managed to get tom oh, energized up yeah. his voice doesn't sound that different mm, no um, that's it yeah it's, and mark Ayres's music i think is it's fantastic absolutely superb because it's so, a yeah. really really joyful project Yes, yeah right. every everything works you know i mean i've, I've got to admit because i i didn't know that final scene with tom baker was coming back yeah but honestly i i got quite emotional do you know i i literally did have a little tear in my eye it was just but, so lovely you know i'm getting quite emotional when you're thinking about it now it's all ridiculous, down to Charles isn't it? norton the producer and director he, yeah he had this this vision in his head and he pulled it off and i think mm. yeah, again attention to detail just getting that beautiful sort of reproduction TARDIS yeah, console yeah. from Barton Hill, um, getting Dickie Howitt's company mm. to bring along a period camera that meant that the jump between... Yeah. And uh, from my point of view, I mean, one of the lovely things was that he said, oh, I want a bridge into that sequence mm. with a shot of the TARDIS spinning away through space 
um, the way it always used to in, in Tom Baker's story. <laughs> dangling on a so, string. <laughs> dangling on a string. So we literally had a star field with pinprick stuff. Yeah. We had oh, a hardest hung on a wire. We were swinging it through shot, and I was thinking, this is exactly <laughs> what yeah. the sort of stuff that I looked at oh, when I was yeah. a teenager going, that's the job I want to do, and here yeah. I am doing it. That's so, proper old school, yeah. yeah. Absolute, yeah. as I say, dream Beautiful. job joyful yeah. thing to work on and really pleased with the end results mm. Mm. so what other things have you been working on in in the last few years well one of the things again that i i mentioned to people is that although the science fiction stuff sounds as though it's it's what's going to take up the bulk of our work in the mm. facts department it's not it's a very very small piece really um and in fact, 90% of the work that I did in the model unit and indeed in my latter years at the BBC was documentaries. Oh, wow. So we did Hiroshima. Yeah. Um, we did Krakatoa, The Last Days. We did Atlantis, um, Destruction of Atlantis. We did one called The Last Day of the Dinosaurs. Yeah. We did a show called Raging Planet which broke down into a tornado sequence, an avalanche sequence, a <laughs> flood sequence. So it's all these big natural disaster style yeah. shows. Um, and all of them are very effects heavy, but um, and, and all big model work heavy shows mm. as well. Um, so it's mostly been stuff like that, I think. Right. So when the sci-fi stuff does come along, that's mm. the stuff that you end up, with most people wanting to talk about mm, yeah not what keeps me busiest okay. <laughs> um, having said that we did yeah. do some work on primeval we did some work oh, on yeah. good omens of course yep, yep. yes um, yeah but yeah i mean the big shows i've done the most expensive shows probably the biggest effect sequences i've done have probably been things like krakatoa and last mm. of the dinosaurs which were big landmark discovery channel shows right um and and big effect sequences so um it's 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 always interesting when you show people the real of stuff yeah. that you've done and they go oh we had no idea you did all that <laughs> yeah yeah but that'd be that's it, the bread and butter work yeah but if you could share that with us we can you know put it out alongside the podcast for people to see it'd be really interesting um so, so what what are you working on right now at the moment at the moment i'm between jobs <laughs> um so um i've I've done a little bit of work with the um, the guys who are doing the the Doctor Who Blu-ray collection. Oh so yes, you probably yeah. saw that I did the um, a little Sea Devil puppet. Um, oh, with with Casey, trailer, yeah, with, yeah, yeah, um, with, yeah, with Katie Manning. Yeah, yeah. I built the puppet and the eggs and things for that. We've just done another sequence for an upcoming um, one there. Yeah. Um, I've just finished doing a couple of writing projects. Yeah. Um, not necessarily who related. Um, so yeah, between jobs at the moment, but always looking for the next thing. Um, and then I've got a few projects that I did a bit of work for another effect supervisor. Mm. I worked with Mark Holt special effects for a while, and those projects are about to hit the screen. So Aquaman okay. two. Oh um, yeah, I was yeah. on for a while, um, and that's being released this Christmas. Yeah, a good two, two and a half years after. I yes, I was going to say that's been uh, a while wait, waiting a while, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, just a little while. And the, the, the company itself, the modern yeah. unit, is is no more. That that mm. um, that that closed down um, the year after the pandemic um, yeah. for a variety of reasons that I won't go into. So I'm I'm back in the in the freelance world. Okay. Again. Uh, mm. As opposed to running my own company, which is um, a little bit of a relief in some ways. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No more of the so um, is that uncertainty, no isn't it? The, like... the, the sort of weight on my shoulders. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, it's very sad because it's you know mm. that group of people have disbanded a little bit now. We're mm. all still socially in still touch, in touch. But, but we're not working together as often. Yeah. As we do, yeah. So. yeah. yeah. We will see what happens. Mm. Um, we, we've got some questions from uh, some of our uh, listeners in a minute, but I just wanted to ask quickly, Mike, about um, you, you know the advancement of CG and and the effect that that mm. had on model work and and how you felt about it. I don't know if you've seen. Um, 
I can't remember what it's called, but it's it's the Star Wars uh, ILM documentary on Disney Plus, which which charts you know their early oh, days yeah. and uh, mm. it's John John Knoll, isn't it? Who was involved mm. in Photoshop and you know Adobe things and yeah, you know go it goes through all, all the you know incredible work that they did there, but then you know the the CG work starts coming in and it's it's actually quite quite moving watching it. They, they do have that little division within yeah. Um, Within ILM, don't yeah. they? It, it starts to kick yeah, in. Yeah, well, I mean, ILM, I mean, ultimately, I mean, their model shop closed down mm. completely. It became a company called Kerner Optical, um, and then I believe Kerner have now gone. So right. there's no denying that CG has had a massive impact on on the amount of model work, um, not just that I was doing, mm. but mm. that the industry in general the was doing. Yeah. Um, and we kept hoping that there would be an upturn and it would swing back the other way. And I think there is some of that starting to happen. Yeah. I think um, the Mandalorian has definitely mm. pulled that back a little bit. And there are directors like Christopher Nolan who have still pushed for miniatures and yeah. practical effects over CG where mm. they can. But you have an entire generation of producers and directors who don't know any other way of doing it other than mm. CG. So trying to present to them, here is some model work, or can we do this model work? They they don't quite understand how it's yeah. going to work. That's quite a shame, um, isn't it? And I actually had a conversation with a producer. We're going back a few years now. It's when I was doing the work on a tongue. Yeah. Um, and she said, oh, I've never seen a good model shot. What? And I said, I'm going to stop you there. She I can't said, have seen much telly you, then. <laughs> you have missed the good model yeah. shot because you haven't realised that they're yes, models. Yes, it's a model. You've spotted yeah. all the bad ones. <laughs> and I said, but that's equally true with CG. Yeah, yeah. If it's good CG, you shouldn't see it. If it's yeah. bad CG, it screams mm. off the screen. I still maintain Jurassic Park is one of the best CG films mm. ever made. Yeah. Because it marries up with the practical work so seamlessly. Yeah. yeah. And it keeps tricking your audience. And mm. you yeah. think, oh, all the dinosaurs are practical or CG. But in that shot, it's a it's a CG dinosaur and a practical Jeep. The next <laughs> shot, it's a CG Jeep and a practical yeah, dinosaur. That's yeah, it. Yeah. Because yeah. of cutting between them and because you've got yeah. a team that are absolutely at the top of their game, I think that, that show still sh ha hangs together as a CG. Yes, it does, yeah. Whereas I've seen stuff in the last 10 years that I think is going to date appallingly badly. Mm -hmm. But again, it comes down to budget, time. Yeah. Nobody sets out in this industry to deliberately do a bad effect. No. Those circumstances that end up creating a bad mm. effect. And, and it's um, often time and, and money, isn't it? Like, like you say, what, what's yeah. that... Um, that graph perfect triangle yeah do you want yeah. money and quality that's it yeah yeah pick two you you, yeah, you know you two. can't have all three <laughs> yeah. uh, it's it's interesting because you know i quite like seeing cg work but i also love seeing miniatures and and animatronics and mm. i was watching um the greatest showman a little while ago and there's some miniature work in that you know mm. city shots it camera flies over and first glance i thought is that, is that cg but on the mm. DVD, on the Blu-ray, you know, there's a whole bit about the miniature work they did for which, you know, celebrating, which I thought was really but nice. But... Wes Anderson has just put out um, Asteroid County, I think it's called. or um, Yeah, Asteroid City. Asteroid City. Beautiful yeah. model work in that. Absolutely yeah. gorgeous. And, and CG is great because in some ways, because you can have creatures and things that you, you couldn't do at all in exactly. animatronics, but then, you know, it would be nice to see you know, close-up shots of an animatronic of a creature and the full body is CG. Well, and when so you I need that like detail. Like the Star Wars sequels. I mean, I mm. think BB-8 is an absolutely extraordinary bit of Oh, it. my goodness. Oh, how, yeah. how does it work? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like it's magnets or something. But, it, you but know, it's but... on set. Yeah. It's on set. Mm. Um, and you can see that the actors are responding to it. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. there's the ability for it to ad-lib, and mm. it, it's a great bit of puppeteering work. A bit and like I'm sure there are full CG versions. Yeah. And, and, you know, ILM are, are, are brilliant at this. But I equally was very pleased to see that there's a shot of a Jawa sand crawler um, that they literally just built a model and took yeah. it out of the desert. Yeah, and did yeah, yeah. Just the, the and, treads in the, the bottom of the, yeah. Um, yeah. Bottom of the chassis, isn't it? Kind of. And, of, of course, Grogu is a puppet. <laughs> you know, a, a five million dollar one yeah. just, just point out here mike that that is the only part of star wars that it jeff is. will engage with is great really? that's yeah. it I, he's, he's not I, I love um i love doctor who obviously uh, 
I love Marvel films, uh, but Star Wars never really grabbed me. And then people kept talking about The Mandalorian. And I thought, I'm, I'm going to give this a watch. And I'll be honest, since I've had kids, my anything that involves, you know, parents and kids and stuff, like, it, you know, always gets me. So I'm like, oh, that, that little green blighter, you know. Yeah, and, then, and then when um, Mando takes his helmet off at the end of Series 2 and he puts his little green hands on his face, so I was like, yeah. oh. But it's, <laughs> you know, it's fantastic the 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 personality that they, they put into him and, you know, the, the work the Star they Wars do. has always done that with its creatures, mate. It yeah, no, I know it has. Right yeah. back to the start. Yeah. And the lovely um, thing about um, sort of Grogu is that I believe it's done by Legacy Effects. Yes, possibly. Which, yeah. Which is Stan Winston's old studio. Yeah. Well, Legacy Effects is now part owned and part run by a guy called Lindsay McGowan. And Lindsay worked on Dragonfire. He built the dragon. Oh, uh, really? Oh, wow. So, <laughs> again, if, all of us are still out there somewhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ooh. So we're going to go to a, f- a couple of um, questions from our Twitter and Facebook, if that's okay, okay with you, Mike. Yeah, please do. So, okay, so our, our first one comes from Fraser Gregory, who on Twitter asks, I think it's quite a good question, actually, uh, given the trend for classic Who effects to be redone with modern effects, how would Mike feel if the same was done to his work in 20-odd years? I got no problem. I've done it to people <laughs> myself, so um, you know, I I went back and 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 redid um, effects work for you know Dalek Invasion of Earth and yeah. and Ark in Space. Now, of those, um, I'm I'll I'll happily admit that my Ark in Space stuff uh, is not as successful as I hoped it would be. <laughs> but um, the stuff for Dalek Invasion of Earth, I was I, I was love pleased that. with. Um, mm. But yeah, I mean, inevitably, sort of somebody's going to come along, and you know. A version of of Aliens of London where a CG spacecraft <laughs> goes through Big Ben the correct way round, the correct way round, yeah. Right so way round. And go for and it. then go hopefully for what doesn't happen is there's a CG overload and the whole of Big Ben collapses, <laughs> the Houses of Parliament fall, and the Thames drains, and, <laughs> and they they do it all. But you know what? Actually, uh, and, and I think this is the thing, actually, isn't it? Because when those things are redone, if there's a kind of um, it's, if they're done right inverted commas there's a sort of respect for the original mm. material like like you were saying on Sharda, you know you guys wanted to, to to do it as it was in the 70s yeah. you know what i mean and i think, and I you, think have to be, you have to be true to the source material exactly it, yeah and no i think point putting something that's so out of place that yeah. pulls yeah. you out of the show yeah no, yeah exactly and, and this is also what i love about um the dalek invasion special effects because i remember on a dvd i think that was one of the first ones i'd seen which had probably one of the first ones which had been done with updated effects wasn't it and i think you know, it's when I looked at it, it's fairly but, early, yeah. Yeah, and it's like the first shot is the Dalek saucer kind of going across um, London, isn't it? Yeah, and and it looks like it looks like it's of its time. You know, well, I mean, the movement is a lot more stable than the really wobbly hubcap that kind of made its way over in the original. Yeah, that, that ship's on the... <laughs> it doesn't look out of place. It goes over Battersea Power Station, I think, yeah. and well, it just we, looks brilliant. We deliberately did it like if this had been done as a series of glass paintings all mm. sliding past each other. Yeah. So we split the frame up in, in exactly that way. So the technique is identical to how it would have been done in the 60s. It's just the tool was different. Mm. We used After Effects instead of, you know, physically filming moving pieces of glass. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but the basic techniques, it wasn't whizzy okay. camera shots. It was yeah. a static camera shot. Um, and and when it comes down over the van and fires, the brief I'd been given by Steve Roberts, who was the producer, was mm. make it look like the War of the Worlds effect from the 1950s <laughs> yes. film. So it's an actual firework <laughs> shot against black Brilliant. and then comp that in so yeah. it's a really nice mix and uh, yeah i think it's really successful and i i wish in some ways um that's where i'd, I'd gone with some of the other effects yeah, yeah, in yeah space what i should have done is exactly what i did on sharda built mm. a model hung it against wires flown it um, <laughs> so again try and be respectful of the yeah. of the material it's dropping into mm. yeah mm. um Nick H from Twitter uh, would like to ask what your, he's got a couple here. Uh, what was your favorite effect? What was one you regret uh, or, or could you feel could have been better? Um, favorite effect is definitely 
Time of the Doctor. I think the, the work we did at the back end of Time of the Doctor is is amongst the best yeah. stuff I've ever done. So that's definitely a favourite. Um, the one I'd like to go back and do again, and I've 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 spoken about this in the past, is um, the early Sylvester stories. Mm. So Dragonfire and Greatest Show in the Galaxy, where, as I alluded to at the beginning of this interview, my enthusiasm for what I was doing um, sort of slightly outweighed my ability to <laughs> do what I was doing. So bigger models, better camera angles, more detail mm. in those models, better thoughts really? about the yeah. lighting and how we were going to shoot them. So I'd, I'd love to go back and do some of those again. So so you mean with, with Dragonfire, you mean like the the the... the... The, the ship detaching from the planet that that shot no, that... not not that one because that wasn't one of my effects that was mm. done by um a, a colleague but the 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 nosferatu taking off off its pad oh, okay oh it's a it's a very oh. simple very yeah. simple mistake on my part so yeah. i knew that spacecraft were hung on wires and you puppeteered them and yeah. i used nylon line well, nylon line stretches under tension so as I'm pulling on the crucible <laughs> to lift the model up, yeah. the wires are just stretching and stretching and stretching and stretching oh. until such a point that, you know, the model it's... suddenly goes boing off the <laughs> Is that what and, caused it? And I was like, I don't understand what I'm doing wrong. And it was only yeah. much later Peter Rag went, well, of course, you use steel wire. You used steel, steel wire, wire didn't you? Yeah. Mm, so as yeah. soon as you do any movement on the crucifix to lift, yeah. the model's going to respond instantly. It was like, of course. Of course. <laughs> so, but he told me that. I never went to school. <laughs> silly things like that. You, yeah. you think, well, okay, if I'd known that then, I'd have done that differently. So yeah. there's a lot of those early effects I'd like to go back and do again. I, I have to ask on that one. It's only just occurred to me, actually, because I watched Dragonfire relatively recently. That model of the Nosferatu, I was sure, looked like the, the, sh the London from Blake 7, episode yeah. 2. Yeah, I'm, I'm really showing it now, aren't I? Space deliberate, ball. deliberate homage by me to the London. Brilliant! I love that. That's that, that's what I love because I thought it's not exactly the like, same, but it I, looks just like it could absolutely be. Absolutely loved those shots in Blake yeah. Seven series one of the London taking oh, landing at Cygnus Alpha. Yeah. And I wanted to do a similar thing. Yeah, so the models built roughly the same size. I've got mm. a photo somewhere of the two of them sitting side by side because Matt oh. still had the London. Um, yeah. I'd built the Nosferatu, so the two are side by side. Ian's is a nicer model, I have to say. Um, but um, <laughs> You're yeah, very generous. yeah, if I was doing that now, my model would be double the size, if not mm. three times the size. I'd have a much better rig for flying it. We, it, it would look so much better. But yeah. again, you know, going back to try and redo that means that I want more money than mm. than the restoration team have got <laughs> to do their entire Blu-ray. Yeah. And just for me to do that one shot. So it isn't going to oh, happen. Wow. But, um, there we go. So we just got one more question from uh, from Facebook. This is from Luke Taylor, who asks, um, "Whose idea? Oh, yes, whose idea was it to hide the TARDIS in the model shot of Red Dwarf, Demons, and Angels?" Uh, that was me, I'm afraid. Of course, it was. Um, <laughs> having having built that miniature set that was yeah. um, a real group effort between sort of like half a dozen of the of the effect assistants this massive you know hangar doors and and this launch corridor and the launch bay at the end yeah. and um i had this little white metal tardis and i just thought you know what if i just tuck it into the corner nobody's gonna see it <laughs> we'll know oh it you <laughs> how wrong you were <laughs> and it it, it it does end up actually visible on screen in one shot. So um, it's interesting so with things I, like that. The, yeah. Those little gags, mm. they shouldn't overwhelm something. It should be there if you know it's there. Yes. It's yeah. Probably a little too prominently <laughs> placed. Um, but yeah, it was a gag on my behalf. Yeah. It was okay with it. We did yeah. it. It's caused an awful lot of interest over the years. I had somebody who, mm. um, from one of the Red Dwarf fan clubs um emailed me we're going back a few years now going mm. there's a rumor that this happened but we can't prove it and i went oh, i can prove it here's a photo <laughs> and <laughs> like, fantastic and they've now tracked it down and they've got some footage of it so got it. it's on the dvd but i think it's in a deleted scene you can actually oh, see it right. 
Um, you know, I'm gonna have yeah, to go back. My idea, I'm afraid, guilty as charged. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's right. It's kind of like um, it's like the Millennium Falcon in Blade Runner in a yeah. way, although that was probably more accidental. I don't know, was it? But but also, I mean, the TARDIS does pop up in a in an Iron Maiden cover as well, somewhere in time. It's was on it? the it's, it's yeah. in the it's in the detail. I've got it somewhere. Hold on, I do actually. Send some. Uh... Oh, feels mind. like it doesn't, surprise, it doesn't surprise me because Bruce Dickinson's a fan, is he? So, I've got all my maiden albums, just not that one to hand, but <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it's on the back of the somewhere in time, somewhere in time. Cover, so. I've only got number of the beast, you got it. Moment, so. uh, yeah, yeah, look it up. But you know, I mean, Doctor Who and a lot of those programs, you know, Red Dwarf, and uh, I mean, Star Cops, you worked on as well, didn't you? Because that, no, I missed out was... on Star Cops, it was oh, being done in the effects department at the time, but ah, um, uh, my apologies, but, um, but I didn't actually get to work on it, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, but you wrote for it at least. Yeah, I've done a couple of audio. Big finish and yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. So that that's um, yeah, that makes me feel a bit better. Okay, brilliant. <laughs> well, and, I mean, I'll, I'll mention it now because it'll be yeah. of interest, hopefully, to anyone who's in the London area. We've got an exhibition um, coming up at Gunnersbury Park Museum. Oh, okay. Um, opening next month, and uh, it'll be free. Uh, yeah, and it's going to be effectively looking at the science fiction that was made in West London by, yeah. the, by the BBC and other companies. And so things like the, the moon buggy from Star Cops, the silver tripod, some bits from Doctor Who, some oh, bits wow. from Black Seven and Red Dwarf yeah. on display. So um, oh, That sounds great. Send us some info and we'll, we'll yeah, put that what, out on our socials. And, what, yeah. what, what's the dates, Mike? Um, I believe it's opening on the 19th of October. It's called Set for Stun. Set to Stun. Set to Stun. Art Museum. Okay, brilliant. We'll, we'll definitely put so that one out. Some of the models I've been talking about, you'll be able to actually get up close and personal with. Oh, fantastic. That's brilliant. I think I'm going to be in London on that day, Jeff. I can yeah, see yeah. it happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, running till, till March next year. Oh, okay, really? so quite a while. Oh, okay, brilliant. brilliant Plenty of time definitely, to definitely be over yeah. that. <laughs> Mike, with, with some of our guests, we do like to play a little game, which takes around about sort of five to ten minutes. Are you, are you good for time, or do we need yeah, to... Yeah, good. Yeah, fantastic. So we are going to play this little game that we call the Grand Serpent's Asteroid. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with the most recent uh, couple of series of Doctor Who, but at the end of um, Jodie Whittaker's last series, Flux, there was a there, there was a moment whereby the evil Grand Serpent, usurper of an empire, or whatever he was, was, uh, was banished to exile, infinite, eternal exile, in the blackness of space on an asteroid. And okay. all that was there was a door which was surreptitiously closed, and he was abandoned with nothing, no entertainment, no books to read, no DVDs to watch, not even a smart speaker that he could bop along to for Miley Cyrus or anything like that. So um, I'm afraid to say we are going to do the same with you because okay. we do do this to all our guests. However, we are not so callous as uh, as the doctor was at, at, at that point. You know, we are going to give you some things to take with you, and indeed the means with which by which you can enjoy them. But take notes: this is for eternity. So whatever okay. you choose has got to last you. With. Fair are you ready? <laughs> okay, right. Okay, so you are allowed to keep Mike Tucker one model that you created. So something that I built. Something that you built, something that has memories for you, something that you can ponder in your lonely, eternal afterlife, if you like, and think, yeah, I did that, and I'm proud okay, of it. Okay, then it will be the TARDIS that comes spinning down into the space station <gasps> at the beginning of Trial of a Time Lord. Fantastic. I, I love that one. That's yeah. brilliant. Um, you'd have to rest it from me, of course, because I would take that to mine. <laughs> but as you built it, all right, I suppose so. You can, you can do that. You are also allowed to take with you um, one full season of uh, of Doctor Who, whether it's classic or whether it's the new series. Which one would you go for? Oh, um, got to be the season with Brain and Morbius, Seeds of Doom. Oh, interesting. What's that? Uh, Tom Baker's one, isn't it? 13? Yeah, Tom season. Is it 13? So it's 13, isn't it? Terror of the Zygons. Terror of the Zygons to um, Seeds of Doom. To seed, Seeds of Doom, yeah. <laughs> is, that, is that one quite special for you, then? You've got a lot oh, of good memories of that. There's there's no top in it. <laughs> <laughs> there's no topping it. Tom, <laughs> Powers, Liz Sladen, yeah. horror stories. Yeah. Mm. 
I'll tell you what, you're in good company there. We spoke to Chris Chibnall, didn't we, uh, a yeah. couple of weeks back? And that's exactly the one that he chose to take yeah. with him as well. Yeah. Now, Plans of Evil, you know, mm. just stunning, stunning stuff. It's pretty good. Yeah. I, I, okay. We'll, we'll let you take, take that one then. Um, should, should we let him take a sci fi film, Jeff? What do you think? I think that sounds fair. You know, when you're getting banished to an asteroid on your own in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. 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 One, so just eight, one, though. One science one, fiction film. Mm, Star yeah. Trek Wrath of Khan. Ooh. Ooh. I've been yeah. waiting for somebody to say that. The <laughs> ear bit. <laughs> Almost perfect. Uh, almost. Go on. What, what, what would make it 100% perfect? Um, a better close-up of Chekhov's ear. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's so oh, obviously no. a giant rubber ear. It's, it's kind of weird looking, isn't but it? <laughs> the, the, the fight in the Matara Nebula between the Enterprise oh, and the Reliant is, yeah. to, to this day, never bettered. No. And again, that's that's model and optical effects, isn't it? Is it, is it even optical effects? Is it just lighting in the cloud tank, mostly? Yeah, it's, it's extraordinary work by Beautiful. ILM. And, uh, but... but Character, humor, yeah. music. Oh, the, the story is astonishing. I, I yeah. cannot praise it. <laughs> Mike, you were already high in my estimations, but now you've gone even higher because, I mean, it is undoubtedly the best Star Trek film. I, yeah. You know, there's no... Yeah. no sorry, Jeff. No beating it. <laughs> no, I, I remember that film. I, um, I, I found that earworm bit terrifying yeah. it is when quite I was nasty. younger. It still makes me cringe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What did you think of the... um? Uh, remake, you know, with, with Cumberbatch being kind of... I've, I've liked all of the, the, the remakes as well. I think okay. they're more good. They're, they're on a completely different level. I think they play with it an awful lot. Mm. But um, I think there's a certain amount of respect for both characters and and the ship as a character. Mm. J.J. Abrams understands... Oh, you love the ship. There's mm. got to be a beauty shot of the Enterprise in there somewhere. I'm, I'm getting a little hacked off with that they, they're feeling the need to destroy the Enterprise in every single every film. Single <laughs> but um, no, Wrath of Khan, I think, is just... It's mm. a beautiful update of the series. Yeah, um, yeah. I feel the same way about Ghostbusters Afterlife. I think... Oh, it's I haven't just, seen that yet. It's so mm. respectful of the original yeah. material. And does something new. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. I, I enjoyed that actually. Uh, you know, I, I really loved mm. Ghostbusters when I was younger, particularly uh, real Ghostbusters. You know, the cartoon that, yeah, that they yeah. did. And I remember seeing Ghostbusters two in the, in the cinema. Mm. And um, yeah, I enjoyed Afterlife. The um, Paul, I mean, anything with Paul Rudd, to be honest, is, is watchable. <laughs> you know, he's, he's good, he's, isn't he? He's great. The only but thing I. Oh, sorry, sorry, go I'm... ahead. No, no I was no. Say, the, the only thing I I wish that it had done was yeah. when you know spoiler alert uh when the original guys came back i felt they needed a much bigger kind of hero shot do yeah. you know what i mean it, they there was like a line off you know line of dialogue off camera then it cut to them mm. standing there and i kind of you know if i was doing it the the uh ecto one you know they just skidded in and the car jumped out in slow motion or something you know the, 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 the superhero shot almost kind yeah, of thing. but you know just something kind of bam you know but then it was it was still really uh effective seeing them and and the, and the ghost uh yeah. you know, nicely it, done and very I, very nicely done yeah and again the score was very very mm. good in terms mm. of harking back to the original score yeah so, yeah lovely and um, and as i say I, I i'm always i'm always impressed when somebody manages to do something new and mm, not yeah. this what's been before yes mm. I'm, I'm looking the sequel is out is it this christmas or is it next yeah, year now so yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Oh, that should yeah. be good. Mm. Sorry, Paul. Next. What no, else that's fine, mate. Just got a couple more now. So you're also allowed to take one fantasy film with you. Oh, interesting. Um, <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Stumped him, Jeff. We got him <laughs> thinking now. Like, I'm, look I'm at not it. a huge fantasy fan. Yeah. Um, okay. I mean, you can bend the rules a little bit. Like we let Chris Chibnall pick. Uh, he picked Back to the Future. He picked Back he? to the Future. Yeah, mm. and we allowed him. The, well, I allowed him the trilogy. <laughs> you I, did because you soft like you know, that. <laughs> it's one. It's one long story. Okay. Yeah. Well, would Raiders of the Lost Ark count as? Oh fans? yes, yeah. yes. Definitely. Definitely. I'll, I'll take that. Raiders. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. I, I'd even allow you to have all of the films. No, as... I'm just happy with Raiders. Okay. Just raid, just the first one, not yep, not the last the crusade. One. Even Sean Connery is in his dad. One of no? the top raiders, purist. <laughs> no, I, I I do agree with you actually. Although I don't know, but I do if like. If you'd insisted on like, like sword and sorcery style fantasy, it might have been Krull. You know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Crow was very special to me. That was like, I remember watching it. I don't know, what was I, 12, 11, 12? It's one of the first videos that I'd seen. My my dad went out. He, he used to own his, he used to run his own business. He used to have a shop near, shop near where we lived that sold, a, you know, bathrooms and stuff. That was his thing. And next door to it was it was a video rental shop. And it just opened. And as soon as he did, my dad went over, struck a deal with the, the guy who ran it, came home one night with this video and a whole ton of VHS tapes. There was Buck Rogers in the 25th century. There was yeah. Crow, weirdly. There was Hawk the Slayer, Hawk I think, Slayer. as well. Yeah, that, and yeah. all of those well, really cruddy I, old I 80s up, things. Only last month, Dragon Slayer on DVD. Oh, man. But they're brilliant. You know, yeah. watch them as a kid. I mean, some of those you probably shouldn't be watching as a kid, to be honest. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, exactly. no, but I didn't care. You know, it's like, yeah, look at all this. You know? <laughs> oh, Krull. Yeah, we, we've got to let you take Krull. Okay, no, it's, so, um, it's Raiders if, it, if, it's, Raiders. if it's general. Yeah. Krull if it's mm. going to be sword and sorcery. I think we'll okay. let you take Krull as well, actually. Okay. You I've deserve it just for mentioning that. Yeah. I don't think Fair anyone's enough. ever said Krull. But that's... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and uh, and the last one. Let's have a look. Um, we'll let you take one favorite music album with you as well. So oh, I'm, yeah, I'm just looking up Crow. Sorry, look at that thing. Oh, he's horrible. Is he? <laughs> oh, I want to watch that now. You got to watch it, Jeff. Honestly, yeah. you should definitely. I, I want to watch it. I haven't seen oh, it for years, but I've just discovered a really uh, '80s looking poster for it, where uh, yeah, her clothes are fallen little... off and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So anyway, yeah. back to the Sorry. music album. Put that, put <laughs> that on my be? list. Jeff Wayne's <laughs> War of the Worlds. Yes. Yeah. I. I. Nineteen seventy-nine. It. Played mm. it to death. So. Um, on vinyl? Would you I've have it on, it on vinyl? Vinyl. I've got it on cassette. I've got it on <laughs> CD. <laughs> <laughs> have you? Did, did you get the? Um, they did an updated version with uh, Liam Neeson, Horrible. didn't they? Horrible. Really? You don't like it? Really? Well, don't oh, like the new no. version. I, I kind of like it. I like so it. It has to be the classic version. Yeah. The, the original is the best. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Uh, that That is the, the Bill pinnacle. Bill Julie Covington, David mm. Essex, Richard David Burton. Essex. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What was it? It's like, it's like bows and arrows against lightning. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I absolutely love it. Played it to death. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, and of course, you get the artwork well, in it as well, actually, don't you? which is pretty good. I, I'm. If it's not that, mm. it's the Pleasure Principle by Gary Newman. Oh, oh one or the other. Okay, I, I'm not familiar, but yeah, Gary Newman I know of, obviously. Um, but mm, yeah, what's that? Eighties kind of. Uh, oh, that's what we let again, seventy nine, seventy eight, seventy nine. Yeah, yeah, even earlier. Yeah, see. That was when you were born, Jeff. Wasn't well, it? Well, <laughs> 79, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a bit, right. bit before me, yeah. <laughs> I can just about remember it. Though, you, you've you've no. made me feel young tonight, gents. So I think, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure I like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Listen, Mike, it has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, yeah, no, thank loved you. it, guys. It's been great fun. <laughs> oh, thank brilliant. you very much. Thank you so much for jumping onto our podcast. And uh, yes, we will put some details out um, for, uh, for for the show, um, the exhibition from 19th of October onwards. So please send us anything like that and uh, and we'll stick it out there. Yeah, but we'll no, send that out. And also have to say thanks for giving me and many other fans as well so many brilliant lifelong memories of exploding Starbucks and spaceships spinning crashing into Big ben and, and yeah. you know all those wonderful moments that have well, meant so much. Believe me, I, I've enjoyed doing it. <laughs> So, <laughs> yes i can imagine yeah <laughs> fantastic mr mike tucker everyone thank you very thank much thank you very much thanks guys take care